The scripture that we will look at today comes from the book of Acts, uh, chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading at, at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, all the disciples. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? This is the word of God for us this morning. Well, we are uh, finally kind of getting settled here in Davenport with our move. We brought lots of boxes, all kinds of things, you know, came with us. And um, I'm glad my kids are now 13 and 11 because they can help with a lot of the lifting. Uh, it used to be I had to lift all the heavy things, and uh, so now they can help some. But they, I also kind of try and decide uh, what's too heavy for them, you know, because I want them to help and, and participate. But some things are just still too heavy for them as uh, a little guy. And they don't want to help, really. They don't really want to lift the heavy things. Uh, they want to leave that to me. But when they were younger, they always wanted to help. I don't know if you all experienced this as well. When they're little, they just, they always want to pitch in. So I'm holding something that's really heavy and just struggling with it. And like, oh, dad, I'll help. And really, they're just going to be in the way. Uh, but I want them to be helpful, you know, and I want to encourage that. So I say, oh yeah, come out, help. Can you grab that corner? And they'll just put their hand on the side of the box, you know, and, and they'll walk with me and kind of, I'll try and do it with them helping. And, and then we finally get it someplace and set it down. And I'm trying to catch my breath. And they're like, we did it. And dad, that wasn't very heavy, you know. And it's like, you didn't carry anything. I had all the weight. I was carrying it all. But I was thinking of that uh, as I thought about the heavy lifting of the church, that we have a lot of heavy lifting to do in the world today. And in Christ Church, we believe that uh, the world will be revived through service, through our heavy lifting. As we serve other people, as we, we care for them, as we passionately give of our time and our talents to other people, um, we believe that will bring revival in this world. And that's a lot of heavy lifting for us to do. And, and I kind of was dreaming about uh, what would happen if we all did that. What if each and every one of us uh, were serving in ministry? What if each and every one of us were, were carrying our part uh, of the heavy lifting that we have to do in this world? Uh, what would happen if we all do that? Now, uh, a little disclaimer, to, to ask that question of what if we all did our part, I have to assume some of us aren't doing our part, right? That's kind of the assumption when I, when I think that. And, and I don't want to say whether I know who's doing their part or who's not doing their part, uh, but there is kind of a general rule in the church that I hear oftentimes uh, that normally in a church there's an 80-20 rule. Have any of you heard of the 80-20 rule? It's just kind of this percentage of things, how things work. It works in other areas too. They use it in other areas. Business has an 80-20 rule that 80% of your sales will come from 20 percent of your clients. So a small 20 percent uh, of the people that you work with will do 80 percent of the work that you do in, in business. Some people say that. Again, it says it's a rule. I think it's more of a guideline. It doesn't always work that way. Uh, also in your home, there's an 80-20 rule. They say that you will wear 20 percent of your clothes 80 percent of the time. So you have 20% of your clothes that you really like, and so you wear those most of the time, 80% of the time. In the church, the 80-20 rule says that 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work. 20% do, and it works the other way around, 80% of the people do 20% of the work. And so there's a, an assumption that some of us are in there serving and doing that part, and others are, are still waiting, I think, to get in there and, and do their part. And so what I'm guessing many of you might be thinking, all right, am I in the 20 or am I in the 80? And uh, those that put yourselves in the 20, you're thinking, good, those 80 need to hear this, you know? Uh, they need to step in and, and do their part. And if you're in that 80, you're thinking, oh, great. Uh, a sermon about guilting me into work, you know, making me find something, some place to serve. And uh, definitely, I do not want, I want to disappoint both of you, actually. I, I don't want to guilt people into finding a place to serve, because I don't think you get the best out of people when you guilt them, right? Husbands, we know that, right? When the wife tries to guilt us into work, she may not get our best work. Um, we might even sometimes do it wrong, just so she doesn't try that again. Um, LAUGHTER you know, so guilt doesn't get the best work. If guilt starts speaking to you this morning, don't listen. That's not what I'm going for. What I'm going for is for each of us to know that we have gifts and talents that we can use for God's glory. Every person has things that God has given them to do for his glory. That's my first point. Every person has something to offer in service to God. Every one of you have something that you can offer 
Each person has that, that gift that can be used to serve in this world. And so what if each and every one of us find that spiritual gift that we have and use it for God's glory? What kind of revival would happen if that were to take place? And, and the scripture I want us to help kind of think through this and, and work through this a little bit is this passage from the book of Acts. It's uh, the day of Pentecost, uh, which was a celebration. And it's kind of a, a something that fits with where we are today. It was a time of transition in the early church. It was actually the birth of the Christian church, and they had had a leader, Jesus, for three years. The disciples had followed him. He'd been faithful. He'd been a good leader for three years, but then 50 days before this passage took place, so about two months before this, is when Jesus was betrayed, arrested, crucified, and died. And then on Easter, he was raised to new life. And, and for 40 days after Easter, Jesus appeared to the disciples and to others and, and began giving them some final instructions, uh, some final things to, to remember and to do. So he still kind of led them in those 40 days. But one of those final instructions was to wait until your new leader comes. Wait until the Holy Spirit comes to you. And then after those 40 days, Jesus ascended into heaven and the disciples had to wait. They had 10 days to sit and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And then at Pentecost, that's what we see, is they are, are in that room waiting for that next leader to come to them, and uh, the Holy Spirit then comes upon them. And uh, the Spirit comes uh, in a kind of a strange way as flaming tongues that then settle on the disciples. And it's after Pentecost that they then go out and they begin to serve the world and the community and they begin to share the gospel of Jesus. And, and major transformation takes place uh, because the Holy Spirit now is their leader as they go out and serve. And, and Helen and I love to go out and serve and to share the gospel with others. We love going on mission trips and uh, being in ministry and doing those things. And I was thinking back to my very first, I think it's my first mission trip, definitely my first international mission trip. I was back in the summer of 2000. I was an intern at a church uh, outside Denver, Colorado. And I was working with the youth group there. And that summer they had a mission trip down to Juarez, Mexico, uh, which is just across the border from El Paso, Texas. And so we took a good group down there, uh, drove some vans with some trailers and uh, crossed over the border, we were working with a ministry called Casas por Cristo, uh, which is Houses for Christ or Houses for Jesus, and we were going to build a home for a family. We had this family, a uh, father and a mother and a little girl, and they were living in a shack. We went to the, the outskirts of Juarez where there was just neighborhoods of shacks. Um, basically, it was a dirt floor, uh, pallets, you know, wood pallets, uh, kind of leaning against each other, and then they'd put cardboard on the outside to keep the wind uh, from coming through their house. Mainly, it was kind of like a 12-pack of pop cardboard. They just flatten that cardboard, nail it to the side of the pallets, and then put a tarp over the top. And that was what this family was living in with many other people in that uh, area. And so we were going to build them a house, uh, a, a solid foundation, about a 10 foot by 20 foot house, not a big house, uh, but we poured the cement and we had to mix it all by hand or by shovel. Uh, we made the cement foundation, laid that down, put the walls up with windows and doors that could lock, uh, put a roof on it and stucco on the outside, which is not fun to do, uh, but put stucco on the outside of it. And uh, it was all wired. It had uh, lights inside, a little porch light even out on the front of this little house. They didn't have electricity yet though. Uh, there's electricity at some of those neighborhoods. You could see See the electrical poles where someone had climbed up and just attached a wire and then ran it down to their neighborhood. That's how they got electricity. So our hope was at some point this neighborhood would have electricity and they'd just plug it into their house and they would have those lights uh, that then would be able to work. And so it took us four days, just four long days of work to build this house for this family. And I remember the last day, it was a Friday, uh, we had uh, finished everything and we were ready to dedicate the house and uh, hand it over to this family. And Juan, who was the, the father, had come that day and wanted to show his appreciation to us. So he brought us some food uh, to share in our group. He brought us two two liters of pop, a loaf of bread, and a thing of bologna. And we, at first, we're not very impressed with that gift, but then we heard that was about a week's worth of his salary. And so we were like, wow, this is a big gift that he is giving to us. And uh, so we did the dedication of the house. Uh, we handed them some household items, uh, the keys to the house, and a, a Spanish Bible and gave that to the family. And then we all cheered and clapped as we handed over the keys. We broke into the food and started, started to eat and, and drink there. And as we did that, I noticed that Juan took the keys that we had given to him and handed them off to his wife. And then he took the Bible that, that we had handed to him. He went over to the side in the dust and just sat down and started to look through that Bible that we had given to him. Now, Juan and I had not really talked because he spoke Spanish. I spoke English. We didn't really communicate much that week. But I, I feel like I heard him loud and clear. As he sat down in that dust, I heard him saying, I, I, I thank you for the house. I, I really appreciate this home that, that you have built for me. But what I really want to know is who is this God 
that would send children from Colorado to care for me and my family. That's what I heard from his actions as he began to look through the Bible. I think he knew the answer was in there to who this God is that sends us, sent us to care for him. And I've never forgotten that message that he spoke clearly to me uh, that Friday afternoon. That we go to serve and, and we go to care for people. There's a task to be done, and that house was needed. It was important for them to have a better home, a secure home for him and for his family, especially for his little girl, and, and he appreciated that. But he needed something more than just a home, that he was looking for hope. He was looking to know that God loved him and, and cared for him and his family. And I remember that's what we actually came to bring. You see, when we do our tasks and we go about the, the, the service that God has called us to, sometimes we get passionate about that. And that's good. It's not bad. But I was so passionate about that house. I was so excited. Give him those keys. You know, it was like, yes, we, we did something. But I had forgotten what we really were there for, to share the gospel of Christ with him. And so it's not that good if we, you know, feed a, a body but leave a hungering soul. You know, and so we need to go about our work and, and do the service that God calls us to, not just to get those tasks done, the tasks are important, but so that that task can help us to communicate the gospel of Christ to those that we are serving, those that we are caring for. And so that's what we need to do. Uh, we serve God in order to help others grow closer to Christ. That's why we do it. We serve God to help others get closer to Christ. We go with that message of God's love and God's care uh, for those that we are serving. And so we need to find those places to serve and, and do it with the gospel in mind, uh, to care for them and to let them know that, that God is there, present, working in their midst. And uh, again, I was taken back to this passage as I was reflecting on what it would look like for us to be the church together, you know, to be the body of Christ, for all of us to be doing our lifting. And God said, look at Pentecost. Look what happened at Pentecost. And, and I was looking at how um, the disciples began to speak. And everybody heard it in their native language, uh, which was very interesting. They were speaking with one voice in a sense. They were speaking their language, but others heard it in others. So if there were German people there, you know, they were hear hearing it in German. And uh, the French were hearing it in French, the Spanish in Spanish. Those weren't the languages that were spoken then, of course, but different cultures, different languages were all there, but they all heard it in their own native tongue. And what God was reminding me was that we have a language that speaks to everybody. God has a language that will touch every single heart. Even those that don't believe in God, if you use God's language, it will speak to them. And that language is service. When we serve, we are speaking God's language. Our actions speak loudly about God's love and God's care for this world. And so our service is our way of speaking for everybody to hear about God's love and God's grace. And so we have to find that place that we can serve. You have to find that place that you can serve and, and care for those who are around you and do it passionately and all will hear the gospel spoken through your actions, through the service that you offer to those around you. The other part that I love about this is we don't all have to speak the same language, right? We don't have to use the same gifts. We don't all have to do the same things. We each got to find our language and allow that to speak God's love and grace. And so you have different gifts to use and, and use those for God's glory. Uh, some of you might be really good with kids. Some of you might have patience for kids and you're able to speak with them. Then find those places to serve, like vacation Bible school and places where you can work with kids. Some of you should not be near children. You know, some of you might scare the, the kids. And so that's okay. Find something else to do. Use your gifts somewhere else. Uh, there's something else for you to do, some other place for you to do the heavy lifting that God has gifted you for. So find those places that you can connect, and that's where you'll be speaking uh, the language that you need to speak. Maybe it's in music. Uh, maybe you're passionate about Haiti, and that's where you need to serve. Maybe it's about hospitality and welcoming people to Christ church. Wherever that is, use the language God has given you in, in the things that you're passionate about, the gifts that you have, and serve in those areas. I was thinking how that's going to work out this week at Summer Games uh, University. Lots of different people using lots of different gifts in order for that to happen. If you come here to the church uh, this week, it's going to be very quiet because a lot of our staff are going to be gone. And I thank you all uh, for being passionate about Summer Games and allowing our staff to go and to serve there. Pastor Helen is already uh, there at Grinnell College working with the staff. She is kind of the head of the team that trains the, the staff. And so she's been working with the 80 college students, helping them get ready to answer all the questions kids will come with and to really pour themselves out into the campers uh, that'll be coming tomorrow. Uh, 
uh, also with her. Elisa and Faith are also there working with the staff uh, and her. And then April is there this year in a new position. Uh, we had a, a woman that was retired that did our registration, meaning they took all the paperwork, assigned rooms and, and dorms and made sure people were at the right places. Well, she retired from that, and so April has taken that over. And so this will be her first week uh, as the registrar, making sure everybody's where they need to be. So definitely be praying for April uh, through that, especially tomorrow will be a new experience for her. But she's serving, using her gifts. Uh, Ryan will be heading down later today to help with worship and the technology uh, pieces that, that go into the worship to offer that to the kids. Uh, I'll be heading down this afternoon as well. I'm the treasurer for summer games. And so my important task is to write checks and pay people and make sure those things are taken care of. Uh, that's one of my gifts. Uh, if I were not a pastor, I'd be an accountant. Um, that's how exciting I am. Uh, <laughs> That is my dream job. If I were not a pastor, I, I would be an accountant, but I, I like working with numbers. And so I do that for summer games and, and take care of those things. But it takes each and every gift, right, to make summer games happen. It takes all the different gifts. Some of them uh, might be more present. You might see them up on the stage. Other things are behind the stage. And they might look less important, but they're, they're not. Every single gift and task is needed to be done. And so we all need to, to find our place, uh, to serve fully in that place, speak God's language to others. And so find your language. Find the way that you can serve. I don't believe that there's anybody that doesn't have something they can use, something that they can do for God's kingdom and for God's glory. So find your language. If you have your place that you already serve, then maybe it's time to take another step. Maybe it's time to, to step up in leadership in that area of service. Or maybe it's time for everyone to lead one. Maybe you need to bring someone along with you, right? Maybe it's time you have a friend that isn't serving and you think they have some gifts and graces where you do it. Say, hey, come serve with me. We have a great time as we do it. And just come, come and join me one time and introduce them to, to serving in Jesus' name. Find those places. And just imagine, what if... We didn't have the 80-20 rule, and we had 100% of us carrying our part of the weight. 100% of us serving in ministry, living out the faith God has caused us to. What, what kind of revival would happen when we all find that place to serve and do it with all of our heart in Jesus' name? Now, let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you that you pour out your spirit upon us as, as our leader and I ask that that spirit would speak to us clearly the language that we have been given to speak. And may we speak that language, the, the actions that we have, the way that we serve, may it speak clearly to a world that needs to hear the hope of Jesus Christ, that love and, and grace and mercy are alive and well in this world, and it comes through each of us as we serve in Jesus' name. We pray this all in that precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.